Hello there, everybody. I'm back by popular demand. By popular, I mean uh, I'm popular with my wife and child. <laughs> Today, states and societies of sub-Saharan Africa. The time period here is basically equivalent to the European Middle Ages. Sometimes I'll even say medieval or Middle Ages here, or medieval Africa, roughly between, say, 700 uh, A.D. or C.E., uh, we don't have to get more precise than that. And about uh, 12 or 13 or 1400, I guess we could stretch it out a little bit there. Uh, I'll start with a quote, as I'm so prone to doing from uh, Stavrionis' classic uh, book on world history. The African continent is immense and diverse. Its geographical diversity has always posed a challenge to Africans, let alone others, but it was never regarded as a barrier. What emerges clearly from historical developments is that even in the most geographically unfavored parts of Africa, the indigenous peoples created important civilizations and cultures. Uh, it is true that uh, for a number of reasons, some of which we'll talk about, which some of which we won't, uh, Africa uh, environmentally and geographically uh, has had extra sort of hurdles and challenges that most parts of the world don't have. Uh, there are some other smaller uh, areas uh, that you can say similar things about, but uh, uh, not to the same extent and to the same uh, breadth uh, as you see in this gigantic uh, continent. We're going to start with the cultural attributes of sub-Saharan Africa, which may, by the way means below, south of the Saharan Desert, so it's like the, the bottom three-fourths or two-thirds of the African continent which is quite a bit different uh, than Morocco and Tunisia, uh, Egypt uh, in the north and northeast. Uh, so sub-Saharan Africa is our subject. But uh, I usually do it the other way around for reasons I won't get into. Uh, we're going to flip it here. I usually talk about the politics, actual events, and you know s s specific individuals and uh, flow of political events, economic events first, and then uh, the cultural attributes uh, of a people, a part of the world second. We're going to do it uh, the other way around, flip-flop it. So we start with kinship groups, gender relations, and women's roles in medieval, again, medieval Africa. Uh, quoting from Bentley, uh, our favorite guy by this time, extended families and clans served as the main foundation of social and economic organization in small-scale agricultural societies. Unlike their counterparts in North Africa and Eurasia, sub-Saharan African peoples mostly did not recognize the private ownership of land. Instead, communities claimed rights to land and used it in common. Male heads of families jointly governed the village and organized the work of their own groups. Thus, most villagers functioned in society first as members of a family or clan. Uh, it's true in most, if not all, societies that the most fundamental unit of organization, the most fundamental institution, is the family. But in Africa, and this is true in some other parts of the world too, uh, it's sort of more of the extended family. Clan is sort of another word for kind of extended family. Uh, going on, Bentley says men largely monopolized men largely monopolized public authority. Yet women in sub-Saharan Africa generally had more opportunities open to them than did their counterparts in other lands. Women enjoyed higher honor uh, as the sources of life. Women merchants commonly traded at markets and they actively participated in both local and long-distance trade uh, in Africa. Uh, Bentley goes on in our chapter to talk about uh, African women often, not often, some of the time even holding positions of power, uh, kings, uh, queens, uh, uh, ruling uh, over uh, uh, political life uh, in a particular uh, kingdom. Uh, that was not the rule, it was uh, the exception, but it did, it did happen. And that women uh, sometimes in some places even fought in combat uh, in military operations and warfare, sometimes in all female units. So, say compared to Europe in the Middle Ages, women in African, sub-Saharan African societies uh, had something, uh, had much more opportunity, uh, much more status than their counterparts in Europe. So kinship groups, uh, uh, sort of summing this up, adding a little bit to it, uh, social hierarchy, uh, starts from the kinship group, extended families, 
Um, the notion of private property didn't exist, said that before, but the community sort of claim rights to land and certainly uh, uh, use it in common, but not, that's not to say that there isn't any conflict or wasn't any conflict over land. It wasn't usually between individuals, but it would be oftentimes between groups. Uh, so the notion of private property that, or lack thereof, that African peoples held uh, is akin to Native Americans' uh, views of, of property, which didn't accord at all with the, the European view. Uh, so, uh, if you don't know anything about Native American history, perhaps you do. Uh, th that's something to compare this to. Uh, a village usually consisted of several extended family groups, and so from the family, then we go kind of the next unit of uh, uh, organization uh, institutionally, uh, and that's the village life. And it was male heads of families that uh, usually jointly governed the you know the the, the village. So we start with kind of the building blocks of community and society in Africa, and then we're going to go to sort of the, the bigger uh, political units that develop from this over time. One feature uh, of cultural uh, social life in Africa that we haven't seen in another place yet, this might exist in other some other cultures too, I can't think of one offhand, but not something we've talked about before in this class. So this is a a unique feature for us, anyway, of African uh, societies. Age grades. What does this mean? Well, I stole this slide. Uh, I do that once in a while. If one is sort of perfect uh, as is, instead of making my own uh, all the way across. Groups of uh, individuals within a given community that are born within a few years of one another. So uh, they often sort of... Uh, to, to, to say that is to say that there was a great deal of emphasis put on, on these. So the age grade itself, the group of people at, you know, sort of uh, becoming adults, young adults, they're not only sort of seen as young adults, but they're seen sort of as an institutional uh, group, and there are ceremonies and specific rites and uh, things that they do when they get to a certain age, you know, when that cohort uh, gets to be, you know, uh, to adulthood, when they get to uh, middle age. Uh, and so... The, uh, these societies are much more organized around different age classes uh, than uh, than we see, say, in European society, Chinese, Indian uh, society uh, at the same time. Uh, boys and girls usually uh, separate at about 10 or 11 years old, then they kind of go into, uh, you know, a boy and a girl uh, age grade. Children uh, bond together uh, to form tight circles of friends and political allies, usually within their age grade. Uh, and not so much without, and you can kind of see there's a uh, a division of, of labor uh, and what uh, boys and girls uh, learned to do. So part of this is uh, about uh, uh, sex and gender, uh, but it's also again about uh, different different ages. So even the elderly uh, divided into sort of a separate age grade. Uh, now just to be clear. This all sounds kind of vague. It's like, so what? We have ages uh, in our society. Everyone's a different age. Uh, yes, but we don't have institutions, and we don't focus a great deal on this group or that group in a formal way anyway, uh, being kind of uh, thought of and identified as a group. It'd be like if in identity politics today we had, you know, middle-aged people. and people will say bo boomers. Uh, but that, that's even not quite the same thing because it's such a m much looser grouping. It's a demographic, uh, and there's really little else to it besides that. So this is actually a, a cultural thing uh, that we don't have in our, in our society. African religion. African religions, at least before the arrival of Christianity and Islam, and we'll get to that in a few minutes, practiced sort of uh, at the tribal uh, village level, uh, an older kind of ancient religion. In, in many ways, uh, this religion, which we could call uh, animistic religion, which is on here somewhere, uh, is kind of the default religion uh, for peoples before, say, they get into uh, monotheistic religions like Islam and Judaism, Christianity, uh, and some of the other uh, non-monotheistic ones like Buddhism and Hinduism that we've already talked about. So animism 
was the religion of choice or something, you know, uh, like it, a type of animism in Native American societies, another similarity between uh, African peoples and Native Americans. Uh, so uh, not all peoples of the world before uh, sort of more complicated systems of religion come into play that have religious, religious texts and, uh, you know, uh, powerful institutions, etc., uh, lots of buildings and land that they own. Not all of them prior to those changes are animistic, uh, but most of them are around the world. African people's uh, religious beliefs and practice focused more on the latter, the practice. Uh, I have mentioned this in class before. Uh, orthopraxy uh, is a way to describe uh, their approach to religion as opposed to orthodoxy, uh, a word that you probably have seen or heard of, maybe you know what it means. Orthopraxy, usually not as much for most people. Orthodox means proper belief. Orthoprax, orthopraxy means proper practice. So there's belief in religion and there's practice. Well, you know, what you believe is are the values of the religion, uh, right? Uh, the rules, uh, the ethic, oftentimes written down in religious texts like the Bible. Uh, and if the religion focuses more on the beliefs, the doctrine, the, the scriptures, then uh, it's an orthodox uh, uh, leaning religion. If it focuses more on the practices, the ceremonies, the rites, the rituals that are carried out, uh, and less on the beliefs and the values and the ethic, uh, then uh, it's uh, an orthopraxy-based religion, leaning religion. Uh, and so we're not saying here that African peoples didn't have beliefs. We're saying that their practices uh, were it, it was more heavily weighted towards the practices and the beliefs in, say, Christianity. Uh, it's the other, it's the other way around. Uh, African religions, uh, according to Professor Bentley, concerned uh, uh, themselves with theology, so there is that, uh, but uh, uh, rather, uh, or, or concerned themselves not with theology, they did a little bit, uh, but with more practical business, uh, that of understanding and trying to control the environments to produce favorable outcomes. This is uh, something I also have mentioned before. We got to... Uh, uh, other religions that were uh, based on orthopraxy. I said they're, they're sort of, and I'm saying it again, they're sort of uh, selfish religions in some ways, not in a bad way, uh, but they have a set of rites and rituals performed by specific, you know, trained professional priests who carry out the rituals the right way, whatever the right way is, uh, to get uh, plentiful rainfall to allow the crops to grow or, or uh, another set of rituals uh, to uh, allow, uh, have the gods intervene to, to give us success in warfare against our enemies who are about to attack us. So it's selfish in the sense that you're doing the, you're, you're doing the rituals, you're going to the religious ceremonies, uh, uh, not so much uh, because uh, it's some doctrine that you feel you, uh, you know, have to go to because you believe in it fervently, but it's because you want good outcomes. Uh, you want to have lots of food, at least enough to feed everybody. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, orthopraxy. There was a, a single dominant creator god, uh, at least in many uh, of the uh, African people's religious belief. Uh, this is something Christians uh, and uh, Muslims will focus on later on. It makes it somewhat easier uh, to, I'm not saying it's easy, but somewhat easier than, say, in Native America, where you don't have uh, one uh, dominant creator god, to get people interested in, in Christianity or Islam, since there's, al there's already a familiarity with uh, sort of one big, powerful god. However, unlike Christianity in Islam and Judaism, uh, these African religions had lesser gods and spirits as well. So there's one big god that sort of took care of the big metaphysical uh, issues and questions, and lesser ones for everyday kind of stuff. Uh, which, uh, if you can do both, that uh, seems to work pretty well. Uh, so, uh, among the uh, things that the lesser gods and spirits uh, were involved in, uh, spirits of ancestors uh, uh, could intervene uh, in the world. 
So this is a religious belief system that not, not only believes in spirits that are kind of right there, you can't see them, but that your ancestors, your uh, you know, uh, dearly departed relatives, you know, grandparents, whatever, uh, might be uh, right around you as spirits now, uh, or are right around you. Uh, spirits also are associated with nature. Uh, this is another part of sort of what animism uh, uh, means, uh, that it's a religion very close to nature, and the spirits are, are usually uh, spirits that uh, represent some physical uh, uh, manifestation, uh, you know, of the environment. So there's a god or spirit of the sun, of the rain, of the river, and on and on and on. So uh, those spirits, like your ancestors, are right there with you in nature as well. So the gods or spirits, and there are many of them here, not just one, uh, but they don't live somewhere out there up in heaven. Uh, they uh, live right uh, in and amongst the, the people. So religious rituals included prayer, uh, animal sacrifice, ceremonies marking milestones in life, marriage, death, etc., etc. Uh, so uh, there are other types of rituals too. We won't get into diviners uh, or the mediators or priests uh, that kind of interpreted the events uh, for the average person. Uh, did the rituals. Uh, usually intelligent individuals, uh, especially intelligent, consulted for uh, explanations for uh, events. Uh, so these are usually you know, kind of like the, the wise men of any group. Uh, sometimes it's women too, as our text tells us. Uh, but uh, they're considered to be uh, extra sharp uh, and probably were uh, because they are being leaned on for all kinds of uh, advice uh, and explanations. Some of it is, you know, most of it is of a supernatural orientation, but that doesn't mean that they didn't sometimes provide advice that you know, overlapped, dovetailed into the, you know, the natural world, uh, not just the supernatural. One would expect them to, if they're that well thought of, to be listened to when it came to worldly affairs uh, and not just otherworldly affairs. Christianity and Islam uh, make their way uh, uh, to Africa just sort of after the Middle Ages, uh, but they both have a long-term impact uh, and an impact that's seen to this day, particularly in the case of Islam. Uh, there are many uh, parts of Africa where most of the people uh, in this or that country are devoted uh, Muslims. Bentley says, alongside religions uh, that concentrated on the practical matter of maintaining an orderly world, two religions of salvation, one converts in sub-Saharan Africa, Christianity and Islam. Both arrived in Africa as foreign faiths introduced by foreign peoples. And in time, the sub-Saharan adherents adapted both faiths to the needs and interests of their societies. So this is true everywhere that you see one religion coming from the outside and it's new to a certain place and to the extent that people you know, in that uh, uh, new place you know live there for you know their whole lives but the religion is new to the extent that they embrace it they usually have to find a way for them to accept it uh, to make it sort of fit in with their own culture so they alter it and modify it to, to a certain extent so uh, it's an easier fit and by the way proselytizers of one religion or another so in this case, Christianity and Islam, those are trying, the, the, the Europeans, the uh, uh, Arabs, uh, etc., that are trying to sell these religions to Africans and other peoples of the world, they're, uh, 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 through hard experience and you know failure, they're uh, learning that the only way to really sell this, if it's going to work at all, is to find a way to tie it to things that the people already know and believe religiously. So uh, even you know uh, the Catholic, Portuguese, Spanish Catholic uh, Jesuit uh, priests in Africa uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, even they recognize the need to sort of alter uh, Christianity a bit to make it look a bit more attractive, uh, blend it with uh, with what African peoples already uh, believed about. God and the gods. This is referred to sometimes as religious syncretism 
S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M, syncretism. It kind of just means synthesizing, bringing the two together. So you, if you're going to sell Christianity to a people that has a totally different religion, find something uh, that's in common, find a way to you know, uh, have your religion meld together with theirs to some degree, uh, so it's a smoother, uh, at least transition period uh, for them. The Trans-Saharan trade, uh, which was became vast over time, you can see uh, some of the lines of trade routes and paths, uh, roads here. Uh, Bentley again saying, by the late 8th century, uh, Islamic merchants had trekked across the desert and established commercial relations with societies in sub-Saharan West Africa. There they found a series of long-established trading centers such as Gao, uh, a terminus of caravan routes across the Sahara that offered access to the Niger River Valley, which was a flourishing market for copper, ironware, cotton textiles, salt, grains, and beads. Uh, and uh, it's important, I think, to stress, and you can see this at the bottom, I like that picture, uh, all of this would have been impossible, or nearly impossible, without the domestication of camels. Uh, and Bentley comments on this as well. The arrival of the camel quickened the pace of communication and tra transportation across the Sahara. Because a caravan took 70 to 90 days to cross the Sahara, uh, and because camels could travel long distances before needing water, they proved to be useful, that's putting it mildly, in an arid region. Replaced horses and donkeys as the perfect or preferred transport uh, uh, you know, animals uh, throughout the Sahara. So it, it, I think it's actually fair to ask the question, if there hadn't been any such thing as camels, could, could this trade have happened and flourished uh, as much as it did brought as much wealth sort of to and fro uh, could, could it have been uh, uh, successful without the camel there is I think reason to, to, to believe that it would would not have been successful or at least not nearly uh, as as successful going a little bit further here looking at the socio-economic impact of uh, Islam uh, in Africa around 1000 again that's kind of the Middle Ages uh, back to Stavrianos again Africa was influenced by the impact of Muslim Arabs who overran all of North Africa in the 7th century and later extended their control down the East Coast as merchants and colonists. From these coastal bases, Islam had a profound influence on African peoples. The impact of Islam was most obvious in the externals of life, names, dress, household equipment, architectural styles, festivals, and the like. It was evident also in the agricultural and technological progress that resulted from wider contact with the outside world. The Arabs introduced rice and sugarcane from India. Islam also stimulated commerce linking the African economy to the far-flung network uh, of Eurasian trade, trade routes controlled by Muslim merchants. Uh, southward, uh, they transported cloth, jewelry, cowrie beads, and salt which was an urgent demand. In return, Africans provided ivory, slaves, ostrich feathers, civets for perfumes, and most importantly, gold from the Upper Niger, Senegal, and Volta River. Much of this gold ultimately found its way to Europe. It became important uh, for offsetting medieval Europe's unfavorable balance of trade with the East, meaning with Asia. The trade between the Sudan and North Africa was so profitable profitable for both sides that by 1400 the whole of West Africa was crisscrossed with trading trails and dotted with market centers uh, which you see right there so but this quote I like because it talks about it tells us uh, once again how interlinked uh, everything is uh, through exchange of trade and trade routes uh, so even Europe benefited from this because the gold going out from West Africa didn't go right to Europe. Uh, it usually went, again, to the Muslim world, but then uh, in trade with, say, the Italians, Muslims across the Mediterranean, trading with the Italians, and it starts to get into the hands of Italians and other Europeans uh, and uh, helped uh, actually change uh, Europe's sort of uh, ability to compete uh, on a global level, at least in terms of trade uh, and you know, uh, things economic. There was uh, a, an Islamic slave trade in medieval Africa, 
Uh, we don't usually learn too much about too much about it. Uh, our Bentley text does uh, uh, go into it a little bit, uh, and I'm quoting Bentley again here. Uh, Though smaller than the Atlantic slave trade of modern times, the Islamic slave trade was uh, was a sizable affair. Between 750 and 1500 CE, the number of African slaves transported to foreign lands may have exceeded 10 million. The high demand that uh, led to the creation of networks with Africa that supplied slaves and served as the foundation for the Atlantic slave trade in later centuries. So there does seem to even be a, a connection in certain ways for what happened later on. Not that that was going to that that was known at the time, uh, but uh, in some ways this sort of set some of the the groundwork for uh, right uh, the later uh, iteration of slavery uh, on, a, on an even bigger uh, and uglier scale. The Zanj Revolt of around 869. Uh, this this was a, a, a long term uh, and big uh, slave rebellion uh, against uh, Islamic authority in the Abbasid dynasty. Uh, it's during that period, um, basically in what's today uh, Iraq. Uh, again, uh, taking uh, from uh, I think this is Bentley a lengthy uprising known as the Zanj Revolt throws light on the nature of African slavery in Muslim lands. The term Zanj referred to black slaves from the Swahili coast, east coast of Africa. We'll get to that. By the 7th century CE, many Zanj slaves labored under extremely difficult conditions in southern Mesopotamia, where they worked on sugarcane plantations of cleared land uh, or salt deposits to prepare, prepare for cultivation. Following a series of riots, a rebel slave army uh, a, a slave uh, named Ali bin Muhammad organized about 15,000 slaves into an immense force or army that captured Basra, which is in Iraq, uh, the most important city of southern Mesopotamia, and even established a rebel state in the region for a number of years. Uh, it took the Abbasid dynasty, by the way, and leadership about 10 years to finally put down that rebellion. So that state lasted uh, they carved that sort of state uh, out of southern Mesopotamia. It lasted for about 10 years. Not so much because the Abbasid dynasty couldn't, uh, you know, didn't have the military muscle to suppress it. It's because the Abbasid dynasty was so caught up with other things, so preoccupied that it didn't really, uh, couldn't really turn its full attention or didn't uh, until a number of years later. But this uh, was a major, uh, this is, this rivals the Spartacus Rebellion uh, in uh, the end of the Roman Republic that we talked about uh, already. So now getting into the politics, the uh, the actual kingdoms, city-states themselves, uh, and some of the leading figures, leaders, uh, the Kingdom of the Congo, uh, uh, our textbook deals with, founded in about 1390, it comes a little bit later uh, in our time frame here, uh, circa 1400, it was one kingdom, six provinces, many districts, so it was organized kind of pretty well and sliced and diced and uh, I don't, uh, to, to sort of give it this administrative structure. Eric Wolf uh, wrote a classic book on uh, Europe's uh, malign uh, influence, at least the malign parts of Europe's influence uh, on the rest of the world, uh, says one of the largest African polities, uh, the Congo. Uh, this uh, Congo kingdom had grown to be among the most important of a number of states along the upper Congo River. The kingdom was large, covering an area of about 60,000 uh, square miles, uh, inhabited uh, by an estimated 2.5 million people, uh, at the time of European contact. Uh, it seems uh, clear that the royal power, the monarchy, uh, would have welcomed the advent, did welcome the advent of new resources from abroad so as to extend its fund of power at home. So uh, the point being made, last part there, uh, is that uh, it was a given that once people like the Portuguese showed up, they were going to be eager to trade with them because they knew it would benefit you know, them, uh, the kings, uh, the, the state of the Congo itself. The Kingdom of Ghana, uh, another of the famous uh, West African kingdoms uh, that became wealthy uh, through the 
you know, the uh, sub-Saharan trade. By the way, that's true of uh, uh, the Congo as well. It's in the same region, uh, basically, uh, a little bit to the south. Uh, but uh, in this case, even more true. The Kingdom of Ghana, very much known uh, for its role in the sub-Saharan trade, particularly gold uh, going out of this region. Uh, the capital, uh, its capital at Kumbi uh, Saleh, uh, about 20,000 uh, people at its height, which doesn't sound like much to us. We've gone over this before when dealing with uh, urban numbers and other uh, societies uh, in parts of the world at different times. Uh, uh, that, that's pretty impressive, uh, you know, organizationally, technologically, be able to bring together 20,000 people to live permanently uh, that long ago. Uh, it, it takes quite a bit of sophistication to do it. There are over a dozen mosques in the capital, uh, lots of uh, big stone-built uh, uh, buildings. Gold, ivory, and slaves uh, were sort of the big uh, thing in the caravan trade, at least sort of going out. Uh, and the Kingdom of Ghana did convert to Islam in the 10th century. What do we mean the Kingdom of Ghana converts in the 10th century? Everyone decided at the same time to convert to Islam? No. Uh, what happens uh, is that uh, when your king uh, converts, you convert. This, by the way, is true in many parts of the world, certainly true in Europe for centuries, uh, with different religious choices sort of on the menu more as time goes on. The Protestant Reformation, Protestants and Catholics, different kinds of Protestants from there. Uh, the rule of thumb until modern times, uh, until very recently, uh, was uh, as it is here uh, in Ghana, uh, and that is whatever religion your king or emperor is, that's what religion you are. What if I don't want to be that religion? Too bad. Uh, you can either uh, convert uh, to the religion of choice, of the king's choice, uh or you can leave, or you can be arrested, tried, you know, thrown in a dungeon, executed. It's up to you. Uh, but this is the religion of uh, this kingdom. So uh, we see uh, then from the 10th century, Ghana becomes uh, uh, an Islamic uh, uh, kingdom. The Islamic conquest, uh, that means coming the other way. When Muslims first came into this uh, area, North and West Africa, uh, uh, after uh, you know Muhammad's uh, death uh, and sort of the, that lightning series of uh, you know offensive military operations uh, by uh, Muslims uh, that brought uh, the religion uh, to this and other parts of the world, so the Islamic conquest gave Trans-Saharan trade new impetus and linked it to the mo Muslim world, uh, whose monetary system depended upon gold the earliest kingdom associated with the growth of trade across the Sahara uh, is the Ghana Empire. The Arabic writer uh, Al-Fazali uh, described Ghana as the land of gold, uh, and Muslims played a key role in trade and administration of the empire. So there were, uh, it was mostly Muslims uh, that were sort of the traders, uh, and even the bureaucrats, civil servants, uh, you know, serving the king. But the king controlled the trade of the empire and administered justice in the kingdom. Despite the Muslim presence, the king clung to the religion of his ancestors. Uh, and uh, by the middle of the 11th century, uh, this sort of uh, went into decline. So religious conflict and destructive wars disrupted trading activities of the empire. Ghana lost uh, control of the gold mining regions, uh, uh, it, it's etc. So uh, this state had a fairly fast sort of rise uh, and, and fall, uh, and uh, but uh, for a time it was a, a, a gem, uh, and mainly again based on its thriving trade and the products uh, like gold uh, that uh, you know were in great commodities like gold that were in great demand. The Mali Empire, uh, another uh, of the West African uh, empires, this one might be the most impressive, or at least well known of them. This one is larger than Ghana, and it was kind of the successor to Ghana. Uh, came afterwards, in some ways, this is sort of Ghana too. Uh, Timbuktu, uh, famed legendary uh, uh, city, uh, a major trade stop in the 
sub-Saharan uh, uh, trade. 25,000 camels in a caravan sometimes, at least hundreds, uh, usually in a small caravan. Uh, at the height uh, of this empire, uh, a king called Mansa Musa uh, sort of made everybody real know that uh, he had lots of gold. Uh, but the founder of the empire uh, was a king named Sundiata, uh, and there was a uh, there is an epic poem uh, uh, that was passed down through oral tradition uh, by uh, people uh, who had the job of being the person who was carrying supposed to carry the oral tradition with you. So you had to have a good memory. Uh, if you got that job. Uh, handed down to you, then you had to be uh, the person that recited from memory this uh, epic and other uh, elements of the oral tradition. Uh, so uh, the epic Sundiata was written down much later on, once written language appeared, uh, you know, in this part of the world, uh, but for the time being, uh, it was uh, oral uh, tradition. But nonetheless, it's still literature, uh, and an epic, it means it's sort of an epic poem, is sort of a long uh, uh, poem. Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey were uh, epic poems uh, of a sort. Uh, so uh, part of uh, what we know about this empire uh, comes from this epic. Uh, it's a primary source document, oddly enough, even though it wasn't written down at the time, it was later. So historians can look at it now. Uh, I, I'm quoting from it here. Uh, we are uh, Barate. It was our ancestor who planted a date uh, a date farm uh, from the Prophet, meaning Muhammad, at Mecca. That was the beginning of our family identity. When the date farm was planted for the Prophet, he blessed our ancestor. Uh, and so uh, uh, the epic does make uh, many uh, references to Islam uh, and even talks about uh, the, the, the leader saying uh, that I'm only going to give my daughter's hand in marriage to uh, the suitor uh, uh, if uh, he converts to Islam and you know, on and on and on. So uh, it's clear from the epic that this uh, kingdom, uh, at least its leaders, uh, took Islam very seriously indeed. Uh, Kevin Riley uh, in Worlds of History, a comparative reader, says, The epic of Sundiata is the account of one of the great families of the Mande people. The epic centers on Sundiata Keita, uh, who founded the Mali Empire. And part of the story is about conversion to Islam and its consequences. The conversion of a king might have consequences as profound as the conquest of a kingdom, uh, he goes on to say. Uh, so, uh, you think, well, one king converting to a different religion, that can't have that much effect. Yes, it can, and we already know why, at least one way, uh, and that is that he can make everybody else in the whole kingdom uh, convert to that religion as well. And this is indeed what happens here. Mansa Musa, uh, already mentioned, uh, one of the larger-than-life figures uh, in uh, this uh, time period in African history. He became famous uh, after his well-known uh, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. I mean, well-known now uh, uh, to Mecca. But he was famous in his own day after that uh, trip. Uh, and uh, Stavriano says, on his return, uh, Mansa Musa brought back with him religious scholars and missionaries. The major commercial areas thus became major centers for education. Uh, Mansa Musa purified Islam on his return by stricter adherence to the Muslim religion. That's sort of coming back. Uh, but uh, uh, going out, uh, this is the part that I think really made him famous and, and caused you know sort of uh, eyes to open. Uh, and that was he took tons of gold with him uh, and to sort of pay everyone that you know, put him up for the night, or, you know, his, and he had a huge caravan uh, with him, uh, he just sort of throw gold at them, uh, and people were astonished at how much gold this guy seemed to have, just, uh, you know, bags and bags of gold uh, uh, to bribe people, or or at least, you know, pay them uh, uh, for, uh, you know, their, which was some bribery, I guess, uh, paying for them, you know, for their efforts, but it was it was impressive indeed uh, to those who saw it, and it was probably meant to impress, uh, I, I would assume, uh, as uh, kings are so prone to doing. We're not used to kings being too shy uh, about showing off their wealth and their power. 
we shouldn't expect it, I think, uh, uh, anywhere in the world, uh, and we don't. The significance of trade in Islam, as Bentley says, for West Africa became clearest during the reign of Sunniata's grandnephew, Mansa Musa, the high point of the empires. So this is kind of the golden age of the Mali Empire, uh, Mansa Musa's reign, the Lion of Mali. Uh, he observed Islamic tradition by making his pilgrimage. Uh, his party formed a gargantuan caravan that included thousands of soldiers, uh, uh, attendants, subjects, slaves, as well as uh, hundreds of, of camels. Uh, 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 he bestowed lavish gifts on those who hosted him uh, along the way. So, uh, uh, just uh, threw uh, money uh, at everything and everybody. He distributed so much gold, in fact, that the metal's value declined by as much as 25% on local markets. So, he's like causing inflate. He's like a. Uh, he's spreading inflation everywhere he goes. So, he goes into one area along you know, the, the long trek to Mecca uh, in one kingdom uh, and starts you know, paying for things in gold. Uh, and as he leaves, the uh, value of the, the money supply goes down by 25%. And he gets to the next region, same thing. Next region, same thing. That's how much gold this guy was spreading around. Is it actually uh, had a huge impact on inflation in all the places that he went through. Uh, so without meaning to, per se, he's wreaking havoc on the economies of every land that he travels through. Also well known, uh, and uh, for good reason, are the Islamic states uh, in East Africa and the Indian Ocean trade. So we've been looking at the other side of Africa on the Atlantic coast. Uh, this is in the, uh, uh, the, the coast uh, that faces the Indian Ocean. And indeed, it's these states that get involved in the Indian Ocean trade. Uh, William McNeil, uh, in his famous Rise of the West, says, In East Africa, the early Muslim periods of substantial expansion in the geographical range of civilized mercantile enterprise. By the 8th century AD, Arab shipping had supplanted earlier traffic along the African coast, and a series of settlements uh, took on a Muslim aspect. In these coastal stations, Arab merchants, in cooperation with native chieftains, bought gold, uh, uh, slaves, and ivory, uh, or brought it from the uh, interior uh, for shipment to various ports of the Indian Ocean. So, uh, in a sense, the coastal cities and city-states they develop here uh, were kind of uh, conduits uh, through which uh, resources and commodities from the interior of Africa came to the coast, uh, and uh, where they met with traders coming in from the outside from the Indian Ocean, uh, who are you know, in, in uh, desire uh, of you know, acquiring gold, uh, you know, ivory, slaves, whatever it may be. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> the marketplace then uh, where the stuff is going in and out uh, are these uh, city-states on the coast or areas, and they became extremely wealthy uh, uh, through doing this. So the Swahili city-states, uh, as they're known, you can see a somewhat crude map uh, on the right side uh, there, Bentley telling us that by the 11th and 12th centuries, trade had brought tremendous wealth to coastal East Africa. By controlling and taxing trade within their jurisdictions, local chiefs strengthened their own authority and increased the influence of their communities. So, uh, city-states, uh, uh, city-states as we've seen, uh, uh, can thrive uh, if they're situated in a way geographically or otherwise, uh, that they're hard to pick on by much larger, more centralized, more populous <coughs> kingdoms like the Greek city-states. The Greek city-states were close to going under. They weren't, they weren't quite far enough away from the Persian Empire, but they managed to be far enough away to hold out against them. Uh, but city-states can be quite potent uh, in what they do, particularly economically, uh, because... A, a, a certain amount of a great amount uh, of uh, competition between them ensues, which forces them all to innovate. So uh, city states, uh, I didn't emphasize this as much as I should have. I think when we dealt with the Greek city states and even the Sumerian ones before that, uh, they they are sort of in in a way uh, perfect for generating uh, innovation. 
uh, for uh, inventions, uh, for new trade ideas, for new technology, uh, you know, uh, for new uh, weapons, uh, because uh, there's this constant sort of competition going on between a bunch of states, in this case city-states, packed closely together. Uh, it's partly what explained the Greeks' success uh, and their kind of unique stature uh, and that time and place. Uh, and something similar can be said of the Swahili city-states here. One of them, uh, and I'm only covering a couple here, is the city-state uh, of Kilwa uh, on an island uh, off the coast of uh, modern Tanzania. Tanzania, uh, Kilwa was one of the most active uh, East African trading centers. Uh, it was apparently beautiful. This uh, painting or drawing on the left is famous, uh, but in a, a, so, a, a sort of... Uh, uh, none too realistic way. It does capture uh, something of the of the beauty. Uh, you see one of the fortresses on the sea uh, to the right, but it was apparently stunningly beautiful uh, in its day, and, and probably still is. Bentley or Stavrianos says, on the coast, the merchant rulers of the port of Kilwa controlled the flow of goods uh, uh, to Muslim trading ships that ranged to the Indian Ocean and even beyond to the China Seas. Kilwa is one of the most beautiful and well-constructed towns in the world. The whole of it is elegantly built, wrote Ibn Battuta. Uh, Battuta is a well-known, at least today by historians, traveler. Traveled uh, much of the world uh, and sort of wrote about it, and his writings survive. So he's a great primary source uh, in world history because he seems to kind of be uh, uh, everywhere. The city-state of Zimbabwe, uh, founded in the 11th century, uh, maybe the maybe the most famous, uh, maybe the most important of them. But uh, again, there are a lot of them, and they were pretty competitive. By the 9th century, chiefs began to build uh, their Zimbabwe of stone. Uh, Zimbabwe, uh, our text tells us, uh, means chief's house. So it's the house of the you know uh, of the chief, the, the leader. Uh, so the chiefs began to build their Zimbabwe uh, of stone. Uh, I'm going to start using that that word. Uh, welcome to my Zimbabwe, uh, right? Uh, which will imply that I'm the chief. Uh, I'm the I'm the guy. Uh, uh, so uh, indicating an increasingly complex and well organized uh, society that could invest resources in expensive construction projects. Uh, so the uh, this is something we've talked about before, Gannon. Uh, other units, talking about other times and places in history, but uh, engineering projects, architectural proje projects, uh, show uh, a complexity of organization, complexity of uh, technology, uh, etc. Bentley, uh, once again, uh, kings residing at Great Zimbabwe, uh, which became kind of like the you know the center, political center, and kind of capital area controlled and taxed the trade between the interior and coastal regions. They organized the flow of gold, ivory, slaves, and local products from sources of supply to the coast. Their control over those products enabled them to forge alliances with local leaders and to profit handsomely from commercial transactions. The Indian Ocean trade generated wealth that financed the organization of city-states on the coast and large kingdoms in the interior regions of East and Central Africa. So once again, these city-states were kind of in a unique position uh, because, uh, again, they stayed small enough and flexible enough uh, and close enough to uh, the other, you know, their small neighbors that they sort of gen generated this... Uh, uh, mutually beneficial competition, forcing them to try to outdo the you know their next door neighbors, so you know they'll thrive and not starve. Uh, it, it, that it, it benefited them as long as they can keep the wolves at bay, because right? uh, you know even ancient Greece, the city states were taken down not by Persia, but well, one of their northern neighbors, uh, right, uh, Macedonia, Philip and Alexander the Great. Uh, who destroyed the city-state system thoroughly by conquering it. So city-states are vulnerable, uh, but uh, they do have the tendency, it's not for sure, things have to line up right in a number of ways, but they have a tendency uh, to be uh, very productive, not just economically, by the way, but that's kind of our, my main focus here.